Namaste. Well, it's been a while since I've posted anything, and there's a reason for that. I'm working on two major upcoming series, and both of these series are going to have upgraded production quality, sound and video both, and animation and all kinds of cool stuff. And I'm not doing it anymore to get followers or to convince anybody or, you know, all, any of that. Oh, happy Diwali, everybody. <laughs> I'm doing it to, well, because it's the right thing to do, to worship the goddess. Huh? I'm doing it to worship her, to please her, because, and here's where the theme of this video comes in. My horizon is like way out there. <laughs> Millions of years, literally. So I know most of you guys are in the rat race, you know, you're in family life or you're in business or heaven forbid, both. <laughs> This is your karma. You chose it by your previous actions. So why are we born in a particular situation? Because of our previous activities and attitudes. So, you know, that verse that I love to quote, yang yang vapi smaran bhavam, tyajatante kalevaram, Tang tang evaiti konteya sada tad bhava bhavita. That whatever you remember, whatever state of being you conceive at the end of life, that state you will attain in the next body. And Krishna uses the word eva. Certainly, this is a law. This is a universal principle. So by putting out a certain energy, by putting out certain vibrations, by creating certain uh, situations in your life, you create impressions and those impressions are stored in the mind. The mind is like a, a tape recorder, records everything. I've experienced this. I've gone back in intensive therapy and relived my birth and even prenatal experiences that I had while still in the womb. What to speak of early childhood and all that. So I know the mind records everything. And at the time of death, the mind is rewound like a tape recorder, exactly like a tape recorder. And one re-experiences everything. And not only that, the attitudes and emotions that went along with it. One ultimately remembers the purpose of why he took this certain birth. And then, of course, it's too late to do anything about it. But I think it's fair to say that most people today have forgotten their purpose. And of course, that purpose is to attain self-realization. So you have to tolerate whatever your karmic situation is. And at the same time, perform sadhana as much as possible. So that in the next life, see, when you remember these acts of sadhana and worship and bhakti at the end of this life, you set yourself up in the next life for a more advanced stage where you're more free, where you're able to detach from the ordinary course of life and do the sadhana and the meditation that brings you to enlightenment. So if it's not possible for you to attain in this life, it will be possible in the next life by your actions, by your uh, sadhana, and your creation, your deliberate creation of certain states of mind, 
certain states of consciousness. So this is what it's all about. So how long is your horizon? How far ahead are you planning? Next week, next month, next year? How about next lifetime? Where do you want to go? And what do you want to be in your next life? See, this is what sadhana is really about. People say, well, there's so many gods and goddesses and there's so many prayers and so many pujas and so many offerings and stuff that you can do. How do you choose which one, you know, or which set of sadhana uh, to do? You know, how do you determine that? Well, it's by your preference. It's by your choice. It's according to your taste and your plan for the next life. Where do you want to be? Uh, where do you want to go in the next life? Do you want to come back to this human life? You know, ew. <laughs> Don't do that to yourself. Don't just occupy yourself up to here with work and family and stuff. Huh? But study the scriptures. Look, I can make videos all day, but I still wouldn't be able to tell you everything you need to know because it's just too complicated. And besides, you wouldn't really get it, you know? So you have to study the scriptures. The scriptures are the source for all of this. They're the source for me. They're the source for every sadhu, for every enlightened being everywhere. The scriptures are the basis. Huh? They are the holy books that guide us in every way. They guide us. They protect us. They educate us. And they enlighten us. They show the way. They illuminate the path. So you should take shelter of the scriptures. And this, again, is according to your preference. You know, do you like Shiva and Parvati? Do you like Durga? Do you like Narasimha huh? or Vishnu or Ganesh? I mean, take your pick. There's hundreds, actually millions of gods and goddesses. And you can go to their planet in the next life. My Adi Guru, Srila Prabhupada, wrote a book. In fact, one of the very first books that he published when he came to the West was called Easy Journey to Other Planets. At the time, the whole West was caught up in the whole space race thing. And going to other planets was a huge uh, meme. Now, it still is. But in those days, it was like the center of attention. So what he did was he showed that in the Vedas, there's a whole system for travel to other planets. And it's, it's so simple. You drop your body on this planet and you go to this other planet and take a body there. The catch is you have to be qualified. You can't just go to any planet and say, hi, here I am. You know, it's like if you're traveling here on Earth and you go to some other country you can't just walk in. You have to have a passport, a visa, you know, some kind, of, some kind of criteria for entering the country. Or they won't let you in. So it's the same with other planets, and especially the higher planets. You know, it's probably pretty easy to get into a lower planet, you know, Patala Loka or something like that. But to get into higher planets, you have to be qualified. You have to be able to show you've done the sadhana, you've done the bhakti. You have the mental and emotional qualifications, the spiritual advancement required to enter that planet. Otherwise, you won't get in. So you have to choose. See, you have to make this life subservient to your next life. And you are the only one who can choose what your next life is going to be. And then you do that by performing certain worship, 
Like, let's say I want to go to the goddess's planet. Huh? Actually, I do. <laughs> so what do you do? Well, you do her puja. You keep pictures of her in all the rooms of your house. So every time you walk in, you're reminded of her. You know, you live in a holy place where she is worshipped next to a temple or near uh, a temple where all day, all night, there's puja going on and creates an atmosphere of devotion to her. Uh, you wake up in the morning and you chant her mantra before you even open your eyes. You chant her mantra. And then if you wake up before dawn, you go out and you sit under a tree and you chant her mantra for an hour or so. Before you do anything else, even have a cup of tea. See, and then the whole rest of the day, you're thinking of her. You know, you offer her incense, you offer her camphor, you offer her lamps and drinks and all kinds of good stuff. You know, we've been over this before in our series on spiritual nourishment, how to do all this stuff. And there's so many videos and so many books on this, and it's really easy to learn. But you have to have the motivation. You have to have the ambition to see beyond this life to the next life and where you want to go. So the same thing goes for any god or goddess. Whichever one, where do you want to be in the next life? You know? Where do you, what kind of a being do you want to be in the next life? Again, the Vedas are full of different choices. You know? Personally, I want to be a sage. I want to be based in, in Amma's home planet, and I want to go here and there, you know, ride my lion and go <laughs> to different planets and inspire and educate people in how to attain the enlightenment, how to attain the moksha. See, I don't want to merge into oneness. That sounds, you know, kind of final and boring. Well, maybe I'll do that at the end of the universe. But as long as the universe is there, Ma needs lots of help, you know, to, to go around and spread her message. This is part of her program. So this is what I want to be. I want to be a sage like Vasishta, you know, or Narada. Now, Narada is an ever-liberated being. He never comes into conditioned consciousness. But there are plenty of opportunities for mokshis, those who, who were conditioned and attain enlightenment, to follow in his footsteps and go around everywhere and enlighten people. And that's just the most fun that I can imagine, you know? Spreading the compassion of the goddess everywhere. Wow, what a gig, you know? What a, what a great way to live. So this is what I want to do. Now, what you want to do is up to you. You, know, you have to decide. You could become a king, or you could become a demigod, or goddess, or, you know, there's so many possibilities, you know, it's just endless. So the, the point is not to stay in this material life, on this planet Earth, this human life that has so many disadvantages, so many troubles and problems. And, you know, it's just full of suffering, really. But you want to get beyond this suffering by attaining liberation. And you want to reduce the importance of this life by uh, strengthening the importance of the next life and what you need to do to prepare for it. See, and this is the uh, motivation for sadhana and for all the activities that prepare us to go beyond the horizon and to attain the highest possible in existence. Aum Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung.